good morning and welcome to Cornerstone, where we exist to love our God, to grow in our faith so that we may serve each other. Thank you so much for being here this morning. A few quick announcements. First of all, we're excited to announce that this year we are participating in the Walk for Life, which is happening on October 3rd at 9 a.m. at Thomas Bull Memorial Park. For more information about what that is, and maybe you want to participate in the walk, maybe you just want more information about what it is, uh, please go to the address listed here below. Uh, but know that we will be participating, I will be participating, and I would love to see some of you joining us as well. As we continue with our weekly announcements, uh, Cornerstone Kids and Crave Student Ministries, just a reminder that your lesson plans are available for you each and every Sunday morning on our Facebook page. As always, we want to continue to encourage you to come to our, our Bible studies. And, and so far, we have our men's Bible study and our ladies' Bible studies that are back up and running. Uh, guys, we are meeting here at the church tomorrow night. Uh, and ladies, you're meeting at the church at 7.30 on Thursday night. So we look forward to seeing you there. We want to continue to thank you for the generosity uh, through the giving here at Cornerstone. Uh, this church is able to, to minister because of the faithful giving of its people. So thank you for your continued support. You will find uh, both the, the online giving platform and the mailing address for those who would like to send in your gift uh, via to our P.O. box. Those addresses are listed below. So as we continue uh, to end this new message series called Emotions, uh, I want to first get us into a time of worship so we can get our hearts and our minds ready to learn this morning. So join me in a time of worship. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my soul. For you are good, good, oh, for you are good, good, oh, for you are.
The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. All right, so we are back in week three of our series called Emotions, and we are talking about emotions. We are reminding ourselves that we are uniquely and, and wonderfully made by our God. And, and with all the, 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 the quirks that God has given us, He's also made us very emotional creatures. In the last few weeks, last week, for example, uh, we talked about anxiety, and, and we, we talked about just the plethora of different emotions that, that we go through. And, and I wanna make it very clear, we are, we are created to have emotions. There's nothing wrong with having emotions in our lives. But what we want to try to, to learn in this series is to be able to take the emotions that we are experiencing and be able to turn those into productive things that we can do to, to glorify God, to bring more people uh, into His kingdom, and, and to really celebrate who, who God is. So as we continue in that series, I want to kind of get a, a pulse check of how everybody is doing so far in this series. Last week we touched on some pretty hard-hitting subjects matter when it came to handling anxiety and, and, and how we can how we can learn to manage our anxiety and and as always today and this for the rest of the series we are going to use the example of, of Jesus on his earthly ministry here and if we can remind you 39 different types of emotions have been recorded that, that Jesus had demonstrated at some point in his ministry. And if Jesus can go through 39 different types of emotions, what a great example of, of the emotions that we will go through, right? So last week, if you remember, we talked about anxiety. We used the example of when Jesus uh, took three of his closest disciples and he went to the garden right after the Last Supper. He went to the garden and, and he kind of just spilled his guts, uh, not only to his friends that he brought with him, but he spilled his guts to God the Father. And he talked about his anxiety, talked about the emotions that he was experiencing. What a, what a great example that we should take from that. It's okay to talk to people. We talk to our friends, right? Talk to God the Father. And then to talk to ourselves, remind ourselves that God has created us in such a way that we are not to be ashamed of the emotions that we go through. But we are supposed to get those emotions under control so that we can better serve God. So we're going to continue and continue this week into some other heart hitting emotions. And, if, and, and the topic of this week is going to talk about the emotion of anger. Now, anger uh, is something that, that maybe some of us struggle with. Maybe you're known to have a quick temper. Uh, maybe you can handle a lot, but when you've reached a breaking point, then you just kind of boil over. You know, anger is something that, that happens probably each and every part of our lives each and every day in some format. Actually, I'm going to ask you a question right now. Do you know anybody that's angry? Do you know anybody that's angry? Now, now, if you're sitting with somebody this morning in your living room, uh, maybe don't point at that person, right? Maybe too awkward. But think about, do you know people in your life that are angry? And if you say no to that question, well, then you're probably not involved in any type of social media. You're probably not on Facebook. You probably don't have a Twitter account, right? Because our world around us, especially with just the, all the things that we are experiencing, our world is, I feel, probably the angriest that it's ever been. I mean, you can't have you can't have any kind of, uh, of of opinion on anything without angering somebody else, and we're going to talk about that this morning. And again, we're going to go back to the example of Jesus. And, and yes, Jesus, who lived a, a perfect, a, a sinless life here on earth, still experienced anger. So the thing that I kind of want to get out of the way really quickly is this: anger within itself is not a sin. Anger within itself is not a sin. We are going to talk about something called righteous anger. And that is exactly what Jesus demonstrated uh, during his time here on earth. And we're going to talk about righteous anger. So the title of today's message is simply Angry Like Jesus. And we are going to again use the example of Jesus and talk about what righteous anger really is. And like I already said, and like the question I just asked, we, ha we experience a lot of anger, angry people in our lives. You know, I just I actually think about someone that you know that's really angry. And one of the reasons that we, we are so angry is because each and every one of us has developed what I, I like to call a filter. 
And this filter is something as we get information, we automatically filter it through our own, uh, own impression and our, our own opinions on things. So for example, just to kind of show you, and again, I have no political agenda here. I just kind of want to prove a point. So if I talk to you about wearing a mask, I am sure that there are some of you out there um, who, you know, obviously who support wearing a mask and think that there, there's a good reason to wear a mask. I also would, would, would tend to guess that there's some of you out there that thinks the masks are not a good idea, that they're just giving into an agenda of some sort, right? So again, whatever your filter is, that's how you're going to process information that comes to you. If I was going to talk about uh, eating restaurants. Right? Some restaurants have opened back up in some limited capacities and I know people like myself who have actually gone out to eat at restaurants. I also know others that are not going to eat at restaurants and that's fine. But, but each one of us has an opinion and, and a lot of times what happens when we get an opinion that's different from ours, we tend to get angry about it. Now we are living in a very political climate right now. We have a huge presidential election happening this year in just a couple more short months. So, so right now everything that we hear is absolutely Absolutely being politicized and, 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 and I truly believe that and so to, and this is not a political statement because I'm sure we have some people that, that lean maybe far to the left that are, that are watching this morning and maybe some of you that are leaning far to the right and there's some of them that, that just say I'm right in the middle and that's fine but everything that we have and everything that comes into our lives is filtered through our understanding through, through our opinions and I want to make sure that you get that this morning because I'm not trying to anger anybody with what we're going to say this morning. I want us to, to be on the same page and, and we're going to talk about unity of the church. And here's the beauty of having a different opinion. It is absolutely okay for you to have a different opinion than somebody else, even the person maybe sitting next to you. It's absolutely fine to, to have different opinion. Within our church, with the diversity of our church, I'm, I, I know I know that there's differences of opinion uh, with people in our church, and I love having diversity within the church. I love having conversations uh, with people with different opinions than mine. I love hearing what people have to say, and we're going to talk about unity, because if we don't have unity within the church, then we are not doing what God has asked us to do. When he says to go in the, into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, I firmly believe that the church, and, and we are the church, we are the local church here at Cornerstone. We, are, we have a place in this community. And because we have a place in this community, we need to have a united front. And we need to, to talk about the, these things. And I want to talk about anger this morning. The anger can quickly lead, even though we identify the anger within itself is not a sin. Jesus, it talks about Jesus being angry. We're going to look at some examples of Jesus being angry in the scripture this morning. And we've also already affirmed that Jesus has never sinned. So if you just understand what I just said, Jesus got angry and Jesus has never sinned. So anger within itself is not a sin. I want to make sure we understand that. But here's the thing. Sin, if left unchecked, excuse me, anger, if left unchecked, can quickly escalate to turn into destructful, sinful behavior. So, so let's talk about this. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So first of all, just by reading that first verse, in your anger, do not sin. It doesn't say if you get angry, you're sinning. Did you catch what it says? It says, in your anger, do not sin. So by that one statement, we know from the Bible that anger within itself is not a sin. But what it does do, if you caught that last part of that, of that verse, what, what sin, excuse me, what anger can do is it can create a, a foothold. It can create an opening in this case, and allow the devil to, to get into our lives and destroy our lives, destroy our relationships, destroy our marriages, right? Destroy our country and just, just destroy our lives. There, the, the key here for believers, here's the key. The key is to never allow the devil to have a foothold into our lives. We don't give him, don't give him an inch, don't give him any kind of space, any kind of room. Because when you start to, to allow him to have a foothold of anger into your lives, he will use that little place to start expanding and trying to destroy your life. Remember the Bible talks about the devil. He is seeking, he's going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is actively looking for an opportunity to destroy your life. 
And that's a warning for all of us. The devil is looking for an opportunity to destroy your life and he will use anger. He will use division. He will use politics and face masks. He will use your opinion on whether you should go back to school or not. He will use your opinion on whether restaurants should be open or not. He will use all these things to create anger, to create discontent, and to destroy our lives. Take heed to the warning in Ephesians chapter 4. Do not let your anger, do not let it turn into sin. Don't give that devil the opportunity to break into your life. So as we talk about righteous anger, let's look at probably the most famous example uh, recorded in history or New Testament of Jesus and how he demonstrated righteous anger. We're going to be looking at the book of Matthew chapter 21. And I'll start reading here just a few moments starting in verse 12. But to kind of set the table for what we're about to read, this is a story of Jesus going into Jerusalem. This is right before the Passover. So there are, there are thousands of Jewish people coming to Jerusalem for Passover. And Jesus was one of these, well, these, one of these people coming to the city uh, to celebrate Passover. And we're going to pick up the story in Matthew chapter uh, 21, starting in verse 12. And let me read this here. All right, so Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Now that last part that we just read seems like Matthew, as he's writing this, almost combined two different stories. We, we, we hear how Jesus enter, entered the temple courts, right? He entered the gates of the temple and the courtyard around the temple, and he started seeing all these people selling stuff. We're going to get into all that in just a moment. But very, at the very end, it says the blind and the lame came to him uh, at the temple, and he healed them. Now, it kind of sounds like two different stories are kind of merged together there. We have an example of righteous anger and Jesus overturning money, money tables and all that. And then at the end, Jesus is healing people. But there's a really big lesson to learn from that. So as we go through our points this morning, uh, we're going to, to turn to that. See, Jesus... In his earthly ministry, Jesus is known for his love. He's, he's not known for his anger. And, and though we do have some example of, of Jesus uh, getting angry, we don't have a ton of examples of that. In fact, it was, it, was it was so uncommon, so out of character for Jesus to become angry. You know, otherwise, we would maybe read in Matthew and, and Jesus for the twelfth time that day lost his temper and flipped the table over. See, first of all, Jesus didn't lose his temper. Jesus had righteous anger. But Jesus was known for his love and not, not at all for his anger. Remember, he loved those people that were outcasts. He loved the lepers and, and touched those who were sick with leprosy. Uh, he forgave sinners. He brought people back from the dead. He, he comforted the widows and, 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 and reached out to those who, who were feeling isolated, right? Jesus was known for his love. So this morning, we're going to talk about three things when Jesus got angry. Three things we want to notice about Jesus' angers. And, and, and first of all, number one, Jesus was angry on behalf of those who were mistreated. Jesus was angry on behalf of those who were mistreated. That's point number one this morning, and that's a huge point. That's a huge thing for us to understand. I'm going to ask some rhetorical questions this morning, right? So just so you know as I ask these. So think about Jesus for a moment. Think about the life of Jesus. Think about the ministry of Jesus. Think about all the things that he endured here on earth. Uh, was Jesus ever betrayed? Yes. Overwhelmingly, yes. Absolutely. Jesus was betrayed while he was here on earth. Uh, did, um, did, was, he, uh, was he criticized unjustly? Absolutely. He was criticized everywhere he went, the Pharisees, and they, they, they would criticize him and try to tear him down. Um, was Jesus hated here on earth? Absolutely. Jesus endured so much uh, on his earthly ministry. Um, Jesus was, was, was constantly be criticized, constantly be hated on. But Jesus never got angry because of what was being done to him. The example that we're reading in Matthew here, Jesus was angry because of what was happening to other people. See, Jesus never got angry when someone criticized him, uh, when they violated his rights, when they, they disagreed uh, with his views. Jesus never got angry at people. 
how many of us get angry when someone disagrees with us? If you're having a conversation with somebody and maybe, maybe it is a political conversation and someone starts telling you, well, I'm this, right? I believe in this, I believe in that. Many of us, if not all of us, start to get a little riled up. You know, we get very defensive of what our beliefs are. And those, that defense quickly turns into little, little bits of anger, little retaliatory things that we try to say back to each other. But if we look at the example of Jesus, Jesus was constantly criticized. And remember, Jesus was eventually arrested and humiliated and tortured, beaten, and then crucified on a cross. And in all those situations and all those circumstances that he endured, never once was he angry for himself. Not once was he angry because of what was being done. Jesus was angry on the behalf of others who were being mistreated. That's a huge lesson for us to understand. It's a huge lesson for us to make some practical application to our lives. Let's do a little, I'm going to call it an anger audit this morning. How often do your feelings get hurt? Do you get hurt when someone tells a lie about you? I do. Do your feelings get hurt when people are criticizing you? Be honest, absolutely they do. What about someone betrays you? I can't think of any acts of betrayals that have happened in my life, but I imagine that if someone betrayed me, I would absolutely feel angry about that. So here is the, the thing that the scripture talks about all the time. It talks about the, the, the concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that should be at the top of our lips. And Jesus talks about when you, when, you, when you do get angry, don't let the sun come down on your anger. It talks about reconnecting and, and forgiving each other, right? Confessing your, your, your faults to each other, forgiving each other. Um, so I want to dive into that. I want to talk about what, how we can really make some application of that because now we're going to also talk about the righteous anger that Jesus evidenced when he went into that temple. So let's get into that. So remember, Jesus did not get angry about, about what, what people were doing to him. We never find that example in the Bible. But this example that we're reading in, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus got angry because of, of, of other people that were being mistreated. And specifically, um, in, in this case, he was getting angry at those who were dishonoring the house of God. Dishonoring his father's house. And so the first thing we're talking about is the money changers. So we're talking about the money changers. We flip the table of the money changers. So money changers, if you don't know what money changers are, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. The people would go in with the currency of, of their own country, wherever they're traveling from, and they would go in there and they would exchange, uh, exchange money. Very much so like if you ever gone to a different country and had to exchange, you went to, you went to Europe and had to exchange some money for euros or, or Mexico or Canada, right? It's the same idea. You go in with your currency and you have to uh, exchange it for the, the currency that was happening there. Now, here's the thing. That currency that was being exchanged was being exchanged at a much higher rate. They were taking advantage. They were taking advantage of people that were coming in, people who necessarily did not have a lot of money and were, were slightly marginalized. And they were they're taking advantage of people who were just coming in to, to, to try to, to make the sacrifices, to try to, to celebrate and, and try to worship God. So Jesus got upset at those people who were, who were uh, the money changers. Um, he was really upset about the people uh, that, were, that were selling the doves. Now doves, now doves, um, sorry. So the doves, they would buy doves in the temple to, uh, to sacrifice, right? It's dove, birds. And if you were to, it's a study is done here. If you were to buy doves on the street, um, there were about four pence for, for a pair of doves. Well, if you were to buy those doves within the temple, they were charging somewhere around 75 pence for a pair of doves. Now, do you remember going to sports games? Do you remember going to the theater, right? And I know it's a long time for most of us, but you ever go down to Yankee Stadium or, or down, down to City Field or, or, or to go over to uh, New Jersey to watch the New York Giants or, or New York Jets play? You know, you could buy a soda for a dollar maybe on the street, but if you go into a stadium, that same, that same soda might cost you $8.50. So you understand that the price hike that happens. Well, this is exactly what is happening here at the temple. These, these people in the temple were taking advantage of people coming and trying to worship God. 
and they were they were giving and they're exchanging the money but charging a lot of money to do that they were selling them the doves that needed to do sacrifices but charging them extraordinary difference in money uh, and taking advantage of them and Jesus came in he saw that and he was furious righteous anger he was furious because people were being mistreated people were being taken advantage of and that's the lesson that we need to take away from that example Jesus got angry not because of what was done to him but because of what was being done to other people so that brings us to our second point this morning when Jesus got angry he flipped tables he didn't flip people he flips tables, but he did not flip people. Now, what I don't want us to take away from this this morning is this. You're saying, I'm giving you permission to go home on your anger to flip a table over or, or to walk into a restaurant and flip a table over. I'm not actually saying that. What I am saying, though, is that when Jesus got angry, he didn't punch somebody in the face, right? He didn't choke somebody out. He didn't cuss anybody out. He, he yelled and he was talking to them about, this is my father's house and you have no right to come and do this in my house. And he flipped the table over, but he didn't flip it over on people. Some would speculate and say the prayer would, would represent, uh, excuse me, the table that, that these guys were having represents just a kind of unjust system that was being done within, within the, the temple. And these guys taking advantage of people coming in. But I think it's very important for us to take away from this point that Jesus, when he got angry, he flipped over tables, but he didn't flip over people. And everybody that, and everybody that we, we come across in our lives, the Bible is very clear that we are to talk about God and preach the gospel to each and every creature. It doesn't say each and every person that we agree with on everything. Did you catch what I said? It doesn't say we should only talk to those who we are in full agreement with. If you could even find somebody that aligned with you politically and, 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 and background and all that, that would be amazing within itself. But Jesus doesn't say, and the Bible doesn't tell us that we are to talk to just people that we are in agreement with. It tells us to go to every part of the earth and, and to be a light into darkness. And we need to be able to talk to people about Jesus. So if our anger turns us into these screaming heads that just, just yell at people and, and, and get mad at people. We are not putting ourselves in a position to talk to people about the saving power of Jesus. Just because we feel strongly about something, here's the other thing, just because we feel strongly about something doesn't mean we're absolutely right either. See, right now, Again, with people watching here, I'm sure there's, there's some of you that, I'll use the COVID example because it's so prominent in our lives. There, there, there's, there's obviously it talks about schools, you know, kids shouldn't go back to school and, and they should stay home indefinitely until they figure this thing out completely. And others would say that I want my kids to go back to school. I want them to be back with their friends and learning in a classroom setting. And it doesn't matter what side that you're on on that, because just talking about that right now, you've already aligned yourself. Remember the filter we talked about. You've already aligned yourself to which one of those camps that you kind of fall into, right? When we talk about uh, social justice, we, we talked about that in a message series not that long ago. We talked about social justice. And again, it doesn't matter what your filter is. It doesn't matter where you stand. I think we can all agree that, that God wants us to reach out. Jesus wants us to reach out and talk to everybody, no matter what side of an aisle they're on, if they lean left, if they lean right, if they're right in the middle, it doesn't matter. We need to be able to have conversations with people. We need to be able to talk to people. And if our reaction, if our anger turns into a sin, it turns into something um, that is outside what the Bible talks about, it doesn't leave us in a position to be able to talk to people about Jesus. See, even even uh, as as a pastor here at Cornerstone, we're making we had to make some some pretty big decisions. First of all, you know when when we when we had to when we had to shut down our services here it was because we had to follow what what the governor was saying in New York State. You know, but I, I know I know of other churches, I know of other pastors who said, well, I'm not going to close my doors. A lot of them made news, made national news, and not just New York State, but across this country as different governors are making different decisions. And, and here's the thing. So there's some people who criticize churches that shut down. Well, if you shut down, you're giving into that agenda, and you should just trust God, and there'd be no reason you should shut down. But then you have other people that says if you didn't shut down, 
then you don't care about people's health, you don't care about safety, you're in defiance of government. See, that was a, it's a hard place and still it's a hard place to be. And, and then we got to the point where we were allowed to go back to, to in-person uh, services at churches. And this is, again, not just here at Cornerstone, not just in New York State, but across this country. Then pastors and church leadership had to make decisions about, can we go back? What's going to be the response of people if we go back? Are people going to feel safe if we go back? And there are plenty of people, I'm sure, that are criticized for, for us opening doors. I'm sure there's people that are glad and wish we'd opened doors weeks before we actually did. But again, the point is, it goes back to the filter that I talked about at the beginning. Each one of us has a, pre a preconception uh, of how we think this world should be and, and what is right, right and what is wrong. But the thing I want each one of us, myself included, is to understand just because we believe it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And, and I want to make sure that we get that so that we can approach this, this concept of, of righteous anger with minds that are not, not skewed by our own filters, but minds that are able to take this information and, and learn how we can use it to help other people. Our goal shouldn't be to be right. Our goal in our lives is to, is to, to honor God and to be loving. And, and, and we, are, we are, should be looking to be right. We should be looking to be righteous, if I can just put it that way. And, and, and if that is, is, is your foundation, if your foundation is you simply want to follow what Jesus says about everything in life, and you want to follow Jesus, you're trying to live a righteous life. Sometimes that means that you might have to admit where you're not right. Sometimes you might have to admit where you're wrong. But in all cases, we need to be able to surrender ourselves and to remember that even in anger, Jesus did not flip people. He did not punch people. He did not cuss people out. Jesus flipped tables. Jesus still had people he had to minister to. And that's why in just a moment, we're going to get to the last part of the verse we talked about where he healed the lepers and, 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 and the beggars that came in. And, and again, some, some might say, well, Matthew kind of put mesh two different stories together. No, that's within the same story. And there's such a big reason why that's in within the same story. So let's get into that. So that brings us to our third point this morning. When Jesus got angry, he loved and healed those who were hurting. When he got angry, he loved and healed those who were hurting. Remember, remember who couldn't get into the temple to worship because of the, the money exchange tables and, and people overpricing things and basically turning the temple, God's, God's house, his father's house, into just a, into a, um, a market, so to speak. And, and when Jesus saw this, he recognized that those marginalized people, the poor people, um, even within the around them that are coming to Jerusalem, were unable to worship within the temple because of the, the gouging that was happening and the injustice that was happening within the temple. And that made him angry. See, but when Jesus got angry, he started to, to love on and to heal those who were hurting. And, and again, in, um, in verse uh, 14 of, of Matthew chapter 21, again, the last part says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. So it wasn't a miscue on Matthew's part. He didn't merge two completely different stories together. He was using this example that after Jesus got in, after Jesus was righteously, justifiably angry because of what was happening, he still because of his nature, because of who he is. And by the example that he set, he went and healed those who were lame and healed uh, those who were blind. What happens in today's culture? Let's just kind of put this whole story, this whole, uh, this whole concept back into today's society and today's culture. What would happen today uh, if something like money changers, using that example, if money changers uh, were happening today, first of all, maybe it would be trending on, on Twitter, right? Uh, it, it, people would start saying, we have to cancel the money changers. We have to boycott the money changers because that is actually the reaction that our society has. And it, and it falls on both sides. Again, left, right, right in the middle, wherever you're at, we tend to have this, this mentality that we need to, to completely cancel or, or ignore or, or, or take away everything that we don't agree with. And Jesus did not do this. Jesus did not cancel people out. Jesus actually did the opposite. He looked for those who were hurting and used that as, as an opportunity to minister to them, to heal them. 
we can use, in the same token, we can use these opportunities to reach people and, and to look out for those who, who are hurt, to look out for those who, who feel mistreated and point them in the direction of Jesus. Talk to them about Jesus. Talk to them about, yes, here on earth, there, there are, there are, there are, sometimes there's misjustices and, and, and there's things happening all around us, but Jesus is the way, he's the way, the truth, the life, and that no one comes to God the Father except through him. And, and though you might feel unloved and, and though you might feel you have nobody here on earth, Jesus loves you. And Jesus is there for you. That's the opportunity. Instead of canceling out, for example, if you have a disagreement with somebody, if you have a disagreement with somebody, we have a tendency maybe of always arguing with that person or even, even worse, we take opportunity and we cancel that person out of our lives. I don't think we should cancel people out of our lives. I think we should use opportunities to see how we can minister to people, to see how we can really help and encourage people. Just because you're wrong doesn't mean you're canceled. And what I mean by that is this, each one of us, myself very much included, has done things in our lives, have committed sins in our lives, have not been faithful to God in the way that we should. We have done things in our lives. And if Jesus had the same mentality that the world around us, maybe some of us ourselves have, if Jesus had this mentality, well, 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 Sean sinned against me, Sean did this, and I don't like what he did, so I'm going to cancel him. We would all be in very big trouble. If Jesus operated the same way that our earthly mentality did, and, and we get angry, and so because we're angry, we're going to boycott this and cancel this and not go this place and do all that. If Jesus did the same thing to us, none of us would be able to go anywhere. Jesus, he didn't cancel us. He saved us. And when we sinned against him, he wasn't angry at us. He provided a relief from our sin. He provided a provision and salvation from our sinful lives. Jesus didn't cancel us. Jesus saved us. And just because we are wrong, we were not canceled. I'm so thankful that God canceled my sin but didn't cancel me. I am so glad that God saw through and continues to see through the, the sin in my life and the struggles in my life and has never once, never once given up on me, but said, I still love you and I want to cancel that sin, but I don't cancel my love for you. That is the example that each one of us needs to have when we're, when we're face to face with people in our lives. People on the street we don't know, people on Facebook we do know, it doesn't matter. When we're facing somebody that we have a disagreement with that would tend to get us angry, we, can't, we don't need to cancel those people. We need to look for opportunities to witness to those people. God did not cancel me. God canceled my sin. God did not cancel you and everything that you've done in your life. He embraced you. He loved you. He ministered to you. That is the example that each one of us has to make in our lives. We go into Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 2, starting in verse 13, the second part of verse 13. It says this, For He, God, forgave all our sins. Whoa. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took away by nailing it to the cross. And this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. I'm so glad again that God did not cancel. He canceled my sins, but he did not cancel me. Jesus, in his example, went into the temple. Saw, saw, saw people being mistreated, people being taken advantage of. And he went in there in righteous anger to correct that. He went in there in righteous anger to stand up. Again, Jesus never got angry because of things that happened to him in his life. Jesus never got angry when they arrested him and they beat him and they tortured him. Or before that, when Peter denied him three times, Jesus did not get angry. He didn't even get angry at Peter. Jesus got angry when others were mistreated. What can we learn from that? 
Well, I, I'm not Jesus. I don't have that same level of, of, of forgiveness in my life. Um, none of us are Jesus, and none of us will able be, be able to, to have forgiveness, obviously, like he has. But we are supposed to live righteous lives, try to live like Christ, Christo, little Christians. We are supposed to be like little examples of Christ. And yes, we will absolutely never be perfect in our lives, but we have a perfect example to look to which means we must strive for that in our lives. That must be our goal, that must be our focus. To love like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to rescue the hurting like Jesus, to look out for those being mistreated like Jesus. That is our goal. That is what we should be doing with our anger. Anger is not a sin within itself. Anger and, and, and righteous anger that builds up within us when we see a misjustice happening in our lives around us, that is what allows us to be Christ-like. We can reach out in justified anger and minister to those who are hurting, minister to those who need healing, minister to those who just need to feel love in their lives. So in closing this morning, I, I want to talk about unity. I alluded to it earlier and I talked about the importance of, of, of being unified, not only in our own lives, but in the life of this church. See, in the ways that, that God has made us so uniquely, uniquely and wonderfully made, He's also made each of one of us to have things that we are passionate about. Things that really stir our emotions, things that get us excited, things that get us sad, sometimes things that get us angry. And I want to talk about those, those differences. One of the things that I'm very passionate about, something I have a heart for, is the life of the unborn. I, I mentioned it this morning in our announcements, but I'm, I'm going to participate in a walk for life that's happening on October 3rd. It, it, it was presented to me. That's something that I am passionate about. It's something that, that my wife and I have actually been donating to and, 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 and funding different um, organization uh, that deals that helps with pregnancy centers and all that. That's something I'm passionate about. That might be something that, that you're passionate about. You might be passionate about something else. Uh, perhaps you're passionate about helping those who are experiencing mental illness in their life. Uh, maybe you're passionate about human trafficking. I mean, that's another hot topic thing that's, that's coming more and more prevalent in our society, talking about child, child trafficking and, and sex trafficking and, and these terrible, terrible injustices that are happening in the world. Those are things that we need to have righteous anger about. And maybe that's something that you're passionate about. Hey, maybe you're passionate about the clean drinking water in, in different countries. Uh, maybe you're passionate about, I don't know, maybe you're passionate uh, about saving the whales. Nothing wrong with that. Never been super passionate about it, but, but good for you. See, God has made each one of us, not that I'm passionate about saving whales, I think we should, we should preserve God's creation. But each one of us, and the way God has made us, has made us passionate about certain things. I am so glad, I am so glad that we are diverse in the things that we are passionate about. I am glad that I, I am passionate about that and you're passionate about this. Because here's the thing, as we come together in unity, those passions, those things that we have sometimes righteous anger about, allow us to have a uniformed approach and allows us to, to have a further, uh, further hand in helping uh, those who are oppressed, helping those causes, helping the unborn, uh, helping uh, create clean, clean water, whatever you're passionate about. But don't let your passion turn into unjustified anger. Let your passion fuel righteous anger, which fuels you to start doing your part and being God's hands, being God's feet, being the example that we need right now. This world is so divided. Left and right, it's so divided. Everything is politicized. Every opinion that you have right now, you're going to have 20 people. If you post any opinion online, you're going to have 20 people with an opposite opinion telling your opinion is dumb and they're getting angry at you because of your opinion. Uh, I want to be careful because we do the same thing. We see something we don't like and so we post an angry opinion about it. This world is so divided right now and what the world needs to see from us in this divided world, they need to see a unified church. A divided world needs to see a unified church. 
Yes, the church meaning both a local church here at Cornerstone. It also means church in the broader sense of Christians, in the broader sense being unified in our mission to, to, to expand the kingdom of God, to reach out to the oppressed, to reach out to who those who are hurting, to reach out to those who are in sin and help to lead them to Jesus Christ. I want to be characterized. I don't want to be remembered by my love. I don't want to be remembered for my bouts of anger, and I've had many of them. I don't want to be remembered by my anger. I want to be remembered for my love. I want to be remembered for my compassion. I want to be remembered for, for maybe some good things that I've, I've tried to do. I think each one of us, if we were honest, honest with ourselves, would say the same thing. But saying it and living a life that matches that are two different things. And that's our challenge this morning. Do not let your anger turn into sin. Do not let your anger turn into sin. Look for opportunities just like Jesus did in his righteous anger flipping over tables, but he didn't flip over people. He, he was always looking for opportunities to heal those who are hurting. And that's why Matthew included the, 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 the line there where he talks about the blind and the lame came to him, to Jesus, and he healed them. We have the same obligation and the same responsibility in this world around us to have righteous anger, to, to, to fight injustices, to, to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. We have that obligation to, to do that. And it's important that we do that. But we need to make sure that the anger that we experience in our lives is righteous, justified anger. And we can learn through the example of Jesus. Let's close your eyes this morning as we are finishing off. And, and, and I hope this message was, was something that kind of touched your heart. You know, maybe it kind of looked close to home in some areas. Maybe you weren't able to make some practical application. But whatever the case may be, I want you to just remind you of this. Jesus loves you. Jesus did not cancel you, did not boycott you because of the sin in your life. God the Father sent His Son Jesus in return to come to this earth to live a perfect life and one day die on that cross for your sin, for my sin. We can use that example of Jesus and be loving to those around us. Use this example of this divided world that we are in to bring unity, to bring love, to compassion, bring compassion back to this world. So as we're closing up this morning, I simply pray, and I'm gonna pray in just a moment, that if anybody here this morning is struggling with anger, is struggling with this stuff in your life, that you just turn it over to Jesus right now. You just admit to where you're at. You just admit that, that maybe your anger gets the best of you. Maybe your anger is not always justified. Maybe your anger is because you allow, it to, you allow things in your life to filter through your emotions and you allow that to turn into to, to angry, unjustified anger. Look for opportunities to, to bring healing instead of bring hurt. Maybe you're watching this morning and you never asked Christ into your heart, never asked for forgiveness of your sins. Well, that's where this journey starts for you. So I'm going to pray for you also this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to learn about anger and to try to make some practical steps into our lives and use the example of Jesus and how we can turn our anger, turn into opportunities to reach out to those who are hurting, reach out to those who have been, who, who have been mistreated, and then righteous anger stand up unified together as a church to stand up for those who are oppressed, who are oppressed, to stand up for those who are hurting, and to lead people and talk to people about Jesus. And God, if anybody this morning, this morning is struggling with anger, God, I pray that they turn over to you. And God, if anybody this morning has never had time and place in their lives where they've asked forgiveness of their sins, God, that is where they start to get control of their anger by turning their lives over to you, God. So I pray for that person right now. They simply pray, God, forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. God, come into my life. Forgive me, God. Be the king of my heart. We ask these things in your name, amen. 
thank you again so much for joining us this morning. If you've prayed that prayer of salvation or, or you have some anger stuff that you need to get off your chest and, and talk to me about, I would love to connect with you. If you go to our online connection card, the address is listed below. I'd love to be able to hear from you so I can know how to pray for you. So until next time, let's continue to love, to grow, and to serve.